Okay, good to see everybody. Welcome back, Mr. Mump. He was back up, took uh, Gene up to medical school there at Northwestern, so he's back. Uh, Archaeology in the Bible, I see somebody fanning already. Does that mean I do this? Okay, all right, here we go. Now somebody else will say, don't turn it down. I know how that is. It's like being at home. But uh, we're doing archaeology in the Bible. Two weeks ago, we finished looking at the period of Israel's sojourn in Egypt. The time from 1876 when Jacob and his family went into Egypt till the Exodus 430 years later in 1446. And the next period I want to look at is from 1446 to 1406. The time from the Exodus to the entrance into Canaan, or also known as the wilderness wandering period. And this won't take us long because thus far there is no archaeological evidence of this time of the wandering. But that's really not surprising. The people of Israel, they were nomadic, right? They, the people, they were nomadic and they lived in tents during the Exodus and the 40 years of the wilderness wandering. You see that said in Exodus chapter 16, verse 16, and a number of other texts in Numbers and in Deuteronomy. They would have had minimal belongings and probably would have used skins rather than ceramic vessels to transport liquids. Archaeologist James Hofmeyer, he rightly notes, he says, one would not expect nomadic peoples who only occupy a particular spot for a short period of time to leave tangible evidence of their presence. For example, we know from Egyptian annals and a stela, and a stela is just an ancient upright stone slab with markings. But we know from Egyptian annals and a stela that the pre-Exodus pharaoh, Thutmose III, who was, if you recall, was Amenhotep's predecessor and Amenhotep II's father, we know that he laid siege to the city of Megiddo for seven months. And Hofmeyer says about that, he says, even given the prolonged period of the Egyptian siege at Megiddo, with thousands of soldiers and hundreds of horses from the chariots present, no archaeological evidence of this camp has been discovered despite a century of excavations and explorations at Megiddo. So when you say that, look, nomadic people you wouldn't expect to find something from, yeah, that's just crazy. You know, we're going to go out there and drag the sand and we're going to find trash and everything. No. <laughs> you see, and so you see, just as an example, you see a seven-month siege at Megiddo we know about. And we've excavated for a long time and have found nothing there. So Hofmeyer, I think, rightly concludes, so it's not surprising that no clear archaeological evidence for Israelites in Sinai has been found to expect otherwise is unrealistic. And in that regard, let me just add a footnote too. I think it's possible, at least not impossible, that the population of Israel is described hyperbolically in Numbers and in Exodus. In other words, I don't rule out the possibility that the number of people and the size of that population was deliberately exaggerated in keeping with a convention of the ancient Near East, of how you report victories of a great king. In other words, that's how they reported their victories. So in order to communicate God's great victory in an apples-to-apples -apples way, I can imagine a kind of standard multiplier being applied. Because if it is true that these ancient kings reported their victories by a convention where they would multiply the numbers and this was an understood convention, if in that social context you report literal, the number literally, well, then you're actually miscommunicating. You would actually be misleading and you would be understating the magnitude of God's victory in a culture that would interpret and hear that through the convention of exaggeration. Okay, so does that mean, well, if you say that then, that somehow the inspired writer is wrong and is endorsing error? No, because if that was correct, and I only offer it to you as a possibility, if that were correct, then the inspired writer would be expecting the original audience to understand him in accordance with the convention of exaggeration. So he wouldn't be affirming the truth of those numbers. He would be giving them to you in that context. 
Okay, so that he wouldn't be affirming something that was false. Let me just read you a quote from David Fouts. David Fouts is an Old Testament scholar. He did his doctoral work on this particular issue about these numbers. And he writes in an article, Numbers, Large Numbers, which is in the, the volume of the Dictionary of the Old Testament. It's a multi-volume dictionary in the particular volume that's devoted to historical books. David Fout says, it is plausible that the majority of large numbers of scripture have been embellished by a factor of 10, 100, or even 1,000 at the discretion of the author using numerical hyperbole within a decimal system. This seems to parallel at least the Sumerian and Middle Assyrian patterns, both of which employed a sexagesimal system, that's base 60, and where the vast majority of their large numbers were easily divided by 6, 60, 600, or 6,000. If numerical hyperbole was employed and is especially prevalent in the largest numbers in Scripture, then the problems traditionally ascribed to the large numbers can be reconciled easily. He says, the question arises as to why Israel sacrificed accurate accounting in its historical documents on the altar of literary convention by employing a numerical hyperbole in the narrative accounts. The reason appears to be somewhat simple. The nations around them used numerical hyperbole to glorify a given king. The writers of Israel's history did the same to glorify the king of kings or one of his theocratic rulers. So I just offer that to you. I think that's possible. That if this was an understood convention, it would do nothing. It wouldn't be a, an assault on inerrancy or inspiration. Okay, and why do I put that here? Because if the numbers, like if it was, if it was 60,355, that a multiplier was applied to get to the 603, well, okay, then it would have been smaller, and so the footprint would have been even less. Okay, do with that what you will. I'm not selling that. I can give you references and resources that you can look at that further if you care. All right, so there's really nothing from, from 1446 to 1406 in terms of archaeological material. The next section to look at is conquest and judges. Okay, so that's from 1406 down through 1051. And according to scripture, in the spring of 1406, when the Israelites were still camped east of the Jordan, across from the, the uh, uh, fortified city of Jericho, they sent two spies to Jericho. You know the story. And the spies, they were hidden, they were hidden from the king's men by the prostitute Rahab, whose house was built into the city wall, and she then let them down, let them escape, and they promised, the Israelites promised that they would spare her and her family, said, you guys, make sure your family's in the place, here's the scarlet cord, put it out there, and we'll protect you. Now, the Israelites, after that, they then crossed the Jordan, you recall, in a miracle of God, and then in Joshua chapter 6, they conquered Jericho, through another miracle, specifically after marching around Jericho once a day for six days, and then seven times on the seventh day, and the priest gave them, they give a long blast on the trumpets, all the people shouted, and the city wall fell beneath it, or under it, I'll say more about this later, that's what the text says, the city wall fell below or beneath it, or below or beneath itself, and the Israelites then, we're told in Joshua 6, 5, and 20, they then went up into the city, they destroyed it, they burned it, and with the exception of Achan, they did not plunder it. In other words, they didn't take any of the devoted things for themselves, though silver, gold, and vessels of bronze and iron were to be put into the treasury of the Lord. Now, here is the tell, ancient Jericho. Ancient Jericho is the archaeological site known as Tel es, Tel es Sultan. And here is a picture of it. It's kind of grainy, but it's from the southeast, and you're looking north, and all of these pits and everything, these are archaeological excavations that have been conducted uh, over the last century or so. And you see here is a western trench. You see here with southeast looking north. This is a trench that was dug by Kathleen Kenyon. Most of this is Kenyon's work. Down here you've got some of the... Uh, what, was, what the Italians have been doing since the late 90s. I'll talk about that more in a second. But this is the site. Now, here's a better picture from the north. It's clearer, and you have a large trench here, and there is Kenyon's trench to the west. And I mention that because I'm going to say something about that in a little bit. But you see how pocked this is from the excavations. The site, it was first looked at in 1868 by a guy named Charles Warren. And Charles Warren goes to tell us Sultan... He looks there, does very minimal digging, and he doesn't think there's anything of interest there. 
But since the early 20th century, there have been major excavations at Jericho, beginning with this German team, or Ernst Sellen and Karl Watzinger. They, they excavated there from 1907 to 1909. And then in the 1930s, a British archaeologist named John Garstang excavated there. Then in the 50s, another British archaeologist, Kathleen Kenyon, excavated there. Then beginning in the late 90s, an Italian team led by Lorenzo Nigro, they are still excavating there at the site. And you see from this diagram, you can see where they've been. You see blue, this is where Selen and Watzinger, this is where they excavated. Green, Garstang, yellow is Kenyon. You see there's her western trench. And the red is what's going on now. You see down here, I'll show you a picture later about this southern excavation that exposes this one wall. So this is, this is, they've been doing this for a long time. Now, the fortifications of the ancient city of Jericho, they were formidable, formidable indeed. Okay, they were formidable. There was a stone retaining wall that was built around the mound. So, you know, stone, that you've seen, they just pick up the stones and the pieces and they have them so that they're fixed. This went all the way around the mound. And you see this stone retaining wall, if this thing's going to work. Yeah, boy, it's getting faint. Right here, you see that made of stone? And that wall was, was uh, 15 feet high. That's a pretty tall wall. But on top of that, they call that a retaining wall, sometimes referred to as a revetment or a revetment wall, but it goes around the entire mound. On top of that 15-foot stone wall was a mud brick wall that was 6 feet thick and 20 to 25 feet high. And then from that, you have this earthen embankment that runs up to another mud brick wall that was, again, six feet thick, 20 to 25 feet high, and that wall surrounded the top of the mound, which is where the inner city was. And you had some, some uh, homes or residences here, houses built on the slope between the two mud brick walls in what appears to be a kind of low-rent district, maybe overflow you see from the city. So you have, you have places built here on this, on this slope. But you can see, I mean, this is, this is a pretty seriously protected place. Now here are two pictures of the retaining wall. And this is from a photo by Kathleen Kenyon, but I couldn't determine where she took this. But you see this brick wall here. Not brick, I mean stone wall. And then here's another one. This is from the southern end, where I pointed out where the Italian team has been excavating. And they've exposed this stone retaining wall, and that's Bryant Wood, by the way, right there. And you see that's quite a stone wall that goes all the way around the mound. And on top of that was the first mud brick wall. Well, in his excavations, this will be a shot here, I think, that'll show you that here you have the revetment wall, and on top of that is the brick wall. And then here is the conjectured line of the upper brick wall. There's not enough of this that survived that they can tell. And you see here, they built a modern road right here, which then cost this part of the tell where they had to dig and do this kind of thing. But so you have, this shows you the two wall, you have the revetment wall with the mud brick wall, you have the inner mud brick wall, and that shows you. But in the 30s, Garstang was excavating, and this area right here, you see A is where Garstang excavated in the 30s. And his excavation there, it revealed evidence of destruction and burning of the city. And so, you know, these things aren't always, you have erosion and people doing things on the mound over the course of centuries. So he excavates there and he finds evidence of destruction and burning of the city. And based on pottery finds, he dates that, that level of destruction and burning to about 1400 B.C. Okay, well, Joshua and them, they come in in 1406 B.C. All right, well, that sounded good. In fact, he wrote in his chapter called Jericho and the Biblical Story in a book titled The Wonders of the Past that was published in 1937. This is the British archaeologist John Garstang who excavated at Jericho. He wrote, in a word, in all material details and in date, the fall of Jericho took place as described in the biblical narrative. Our demonstration is limited, however, to material observations. The walls fell, shaken apparently by earthquake, and the city was destroyed by fire about 1400 B.C. 
These are the basic facts resulting from our investigations. The link with Joshua and the Israelites is only circumstantial, but it seems to be solid and without flaw. So this was his opinion. Now, his conclusions were controversial. You say, why would they be controversial? I didn't dig into that, but my guess is that anything that confirms the Bible in our age is going to be said, that's not right. You just are being biased and you're, okay. So they're, quote, controversial. It's like Tim Tebow is controversial. Okay, why is that? Uh, well, he doesn't get shot, I guess. Uh, that's a footnote. But you, you see, so I think that's what's behind it, but I didn't dig into that. But so at his request, he had another British archaeologist, Kathleen Kenyon, to do digging at the site, further excavation. And her excavations, she excavated, she dug these, she excavated many places. I showed you that diagram first. But where she finds the evidence of destruction and burning, she digs these two shafts just north of where Garstang had dug and found the evidence. Garstang dug in other places. This is where he finds the destruction and the burning. She digs two shafts just north of there, and she confirms and finds also evidence of extensive destruction by fire. Now, she also finds many jars that are filled with burned grain. Now, this is significant, you see. Here's a picture of their, their doing artwork of the jars of grain that they have found. And here's what Wood says, a total of six bushels of grain were discovered in a single excavation season amid the charred debris of City 4, giving an important clue to the city's demise. Its end could not have come as a result of a siege, you know, where the, the enemy surrounds the city and blocks everything, because then you have time to consume all the food that's there. So he says it couldn't have come as the result of a siege, uh, because that would have exhausted the city's food supply. Instead, the attack must have occurred suddenly soon after the spring harvest because they have such abundant grain there. So it gives us a clue. It's in the spring. The fall of the city was not through a siege. He says two crucial details that match the account in the book of Joshua. Here's a close-up of one of the pots. You can see, I hope, here you see the handle of the pot and you see the grain in there. So Kenyon finds all of this, but she concluded, as had an earlier archaeologist, that the destruction of Jericho occurred in 1550 B.C. Garstang had dated it based on pottery. He said for, around 1400. She comes in. She confirms the destruction. She confirms the burning. She finds these jars stored grain that's been burned. But she says it, the destruction happened 150 years earlier so there was no occupation of Jericho at the time Joshua came. There was no city for him to conquer. Now, that is still the opinion of most archaeologists. So you need to note that. But let me tell you that opinion has been forcefully challenged. In an article in Biblical Archaeology Review in 1990, the archaeologist Bryant Wood, whose particular specialty is Canaanite pottery of the 15th century B.C., that's his little narrow field. I mean, he's an archaeologist. You see, he's been out excavating and all that. But his specialty is Canaanite pottery of the 15th century B.C. Well, he criticized Kenyon's analysis, and he found that four lines of evidence, ceramic data, stratigraphical considerations, scarab evidence, these little stones that look like beetles, scarab evidence, and radiocarbon dating, which I'll talk about in a minute, that's no longer supportive, really. That's now more ambiguous. But when he published, he had those four lines of evidence. He said they support Garstang's dating over the dating of Kathleen Kenyon. And here's what Wood says. When the evidence is critically examined, there's no basis for Kenyon's contention that City 4 was destroyed by the Hyksos or Egyptians in the mid-16th century BCE. The pottery, stratigraphic considerations, scarab data, and carbon-14 date, I said now conflicting, and, and I'll say more about that in a second, all point to a destruction of the city around the end of Late Bronze I, about 1400 BCE. Garstang's original date for this event appears to be the correct one. Okay, what's up with the carbon-14? Well, regarding that, the original date of around 1400, at which was the date at the time Wood published his article, that was said to be an error. And then it was then corrected, and you wound up with a broad range of from 1700 to 1417 B.C. 
but subsequent tests on six grain samples from the destruction level, they produced C14 dates of 1640, between 1640 and 1520 BC. Okay, right where Kenyon said. Overlapping Kenyon's 1550 date. Then you had tests on, tests on 12 charcoal samples from the destruction level. They resulted in dates between 1690 and 1610. Well, we're now much older than, than uh, Wood claims, but older than Kenyon claimed. So 1690 to 16. Then test on two samples submitted by the Italian team that began excavating in the late 90s. Dates between 1437 and 1262, and then between 1688 and 1506. The point is, is that most of the dates produced by carbon-14 after that first date, which was corrected, are significantly older than Wood's contention that the destruction level was around 1400. Okay, well, okay, you have some people say, well, that's it then. You know, carbon-14, that's it, baby. That proves everything. But that's not dispositive, okay, because the carbon-14 dates from this time period in the Near East, they routinely are a century or two older than what are considered solid archaeological dates. In other words, you have people who've worked on these chronologies and things, and they have something that they're considering, this is solid, I know the date of this. And then it's being carbon tested, and they say that date's off. That date is wrong. And to give you an analogy, it would be like if there was a, a, a layer of volcanic ash over, and therefore, therefore younger, over a Corvette Stingray. And we dated the layer of volcanic ash, which is above the Corvette Stingray, therefore the Stingray is older, we dated that level to 1900. Well, that would tell you. You would say there's something wrong with that because I know the Stingray wasn't older than 1900. It didn't come into the early 60s. All right, well, this is what's going on with them. These archaeologists are just as convinced that they understand the dates of certain things. And so they're saying there's something wrong here. There's something amiss with, with this dating. And it's not just biblical archaeologists. Manfred Bitek, who's a very, you know, world-renowned archaeologist, the guy who's, who's excavating at Tel El Daba, he's somebody who makes this case and says, listen, there's a problem. And it seems that there's a problem with the calibration that's necessary. I don't want to get into... Uh, you know, I could get off into the weeds on this. But you don't just go and get calendar dates from carbon-14 dating. As carbon-14 ticks down, okay, as it transforms into nitrogen-14, what shifts and what they measure is the ratio between carbon-14 and carbon-12. But that ratio of carbon-14 and carbon-12 isn't stable in the atmosphere. So you don't know what the beginning ratio was. You have to calibrate it somehow. All right, so in creating that calibrating curve that allows us to go from radiocarbon dates to calendar years, radiocarbon years to calendar years, you have to calibrate it, and it looks like there's a problem somewhere in that. In fact, uh, it's a hot topic, uh, hotly debated right now. Just last November, November of 2015, Roger Young presented a paper at the annual meeting of the Near East Archaeological Society titled Anomalies in Radiocarbon versus archaeological dating are not the invention of biblical archaeologists. That was his title, and you can find that uh, presentation online. Well, Wood wrote in 2008, he said, he, remember his article, First Challenge in Kenyon's Dating, was in 1990. 2008, he says, my dating of the destruction of Jericho to around 1400 B.C. is based on pottery. You see, that's why I use the stingray, because we say, who can tell pots? Well, they understand styles of pots. And that's how they're like, you understand styles of cars. And so they're confident when they say, say no, that, that would be just like saying the Stingway was around in 1900. So they understand that. So this is his thing. He says, I, I, I dated it based on pottery, which in turn is based on Egyptian chronology. Jericho is just one example of the discrepancy between historical and C14 dates for the second millennium BC. C14 dates are consistently 100 to 150 years earlier than historical dates. There is a heated debate going on among scholars concerning this, especially with regard to the date of the eruption of Thera, or Santorini, this is a volcano. Because of the inconsistencies and uncertainties of C14 dating, 
I underlined this, most archaeologists prefer historical dates over C14 dates. Okay, so it's not a thing, well, okay, that's, we got a C14 date that conflicts with that, that's it. It's not like that. Now, they want you to think it's like that. But I want you to be aware that it's not like that. Okay, there's more going on here. Well, Wood's analysis in 1990, his analysis in that 1990 article in Biblical Archaeological Review, or Biblical Archaeology Review, it was challenged in a subsequent issue of the journal. You know how they work it. You get to publish something, and then they get let somebody else come in and say, ah, this guy's all wet. Okay, it was challenged in a subsequent issue of that journal by an archaeologist named Piotr Benkowski, which prompted a detailed response from Wood. Wood's response is titled, Dating Jericho's Destruction, Benkowski's Wrong on All Counts. <laughs> and the flavor of that response you can get from, it's captured by the title, and from the following quotes that I took from the beginning, near the beginning and near the end of that article. Wood says, Bienkowski's attempt to explain away the evidence for lowering the date of the destruction of Jericho is misguided and void of substance. Assertions made without data to back them up are unconvincing. His discussion is superficial at best, lacking both depth and precision. A review of the evidence relevant to the date of the destruction of Jericho reveals that Bienkowski's objections do not stand up to critical assessment. Unless Bienkowski is prepared to rewrite the archaeological history of Palestine, he's going to have to accept the fact that Jericho was destroyed early in the late bonds in about 1400 BCE. So here you have somebody who's, I mean, this is, as I say, this idea, most archaeologists would accept that because I'm convinced most archaeologists, uh, secular people, are going to say, now, I'm not going to do anything that will give these religious people a bone, Okay. Ah, they'd say you're crazy about that. Okay, maybe I'm maybe I'm I have a lens that looks at them poorly. But you know, I, I think that element is there. And so Wood's presenting stuff and saying, here's the case. And they come up and say, No, it's not, and then he says, Oh, contrary, yes, it is. And that's what he's presented. So I want you to recognize this is going on. Now, addition to in, in addition to Wood's confirmation of Garstang's date for the, the, the destruction level of Teles Sultan. There are other pieces of evidence that tie that destruction to the Israelite assault that's recorded in Joshua. And the more you tie the archaeological record to the assault that's recorded in Joshua, well, then that even becomes further evidence for the date. Not only is it evidence that it was the Israelites who did this, but it also then becomes further evidence for the date. And Wood says... Was this destruction at the hands of the Israelites? The correlation between the archaeological evidence and the biblical narrative is substantial. The city was strongly fortified, as indicated in Joshua in those verses. The attack occurred just after harvest time in the spring. The inhabitants had no opportunity to flee with their foodstuffs. The siege was short. The walls were leveled, possibly by an earthquake. The city was not plundered. The city was burned. Okay, the city was not plundered with the exception of Achan, of course. But you see, why is that significant? That's because when you find this grain that's there, you would expect to see somebody who's in a military, the grain was valuable. It wasn't simply that you could take it and use it for food, although it's valuable in that regard, but you'd also take the grain and you'd use it as a commodity for bartering. And the fact they left it there is consistent with the idea they were told not to plunder the city. It was devoted to destruction. And so that's just another one of the factors you see that ties that in. Now regarding the walls, remember that you've got this fortification system that involved this mud brick wall that's built atop this stone retaining wall, that retaining wall that surrounded the base, and you have another mud brick wall That's higher up the earthen embankment that surrounded the inner city. And here's a diagram of the north face of Kenyon's western trench. I pointed out her western trench where she dug this deep trench right through the tell. And here's a diagram of the north face of that western trench. And I want you to see, here's the retaining wall. You see? Well, what are these things down here? What's this red stuff? Well, let me see if I can read that. It says, fallen red bricks. <laughs> These bricks make a ramp that goes up to the top of the retaining wall. 
And here's what Kenyon, Kenyon says. These are Kenyon's words. She says she found, quote, fallen red bricks piling nearly to the top of the revetment, that's what she calls the retaining wall, adding, these probably came from the wall on the summit of the bank, the wall that surrounds the inner city, and or the brickwork above the revetment. So she says, I find all of these walls, all of these stones that are piled up here, forming a ramp up to the top of the retaining wall, and they probably came from the brick walls that were up higher. And they came down. Well, here's an illustration of what something like this might have looked like. You see here the brick, the retaining wall. You see the mud brick wall, thick. You see houses built into the mud brick wall. And you see the collapse of the wall here. Now, this is just somebody's idea. It could have been more of the wall was collapsed to produce the ramp of the bricks that would let you come over the retaining wall. You see, so this is an idea as they march around and they do, and they do that. You, you get to see that possibility. Now, most English translations in, in Joshua 6, 5 and Joshua chapter 6, verse 20, my highly efficient marker or pointer has just fallen. Uh, most of these translations, they render the clause in Joshua 6, 5 and, and 6, 20 that the city wall will fall or fell. In one case, it's saying it will fall. In the other case, it's saying it fell. But the city wall will fall or fell flat. That's how most of the translations render it. But the text literally says that the city wall will fall or fell below or beneath it or below or beneath itself. So it could mean either that the wall collapsed in place. You could say that, well, it just fell, you know, right there where it stood or it could mean that the wall fell so as to end up below the city or below where it had formerly stood. And that's just an interesting, I don't want to make too much of that, but it's just an interesting kind of thing that, you know, here the, whoever's writing this apparently understands and sees Jericho or is aware and has accurate information about Jericho. And then you see in 6.5 and 6.20, the phrase that says, and the people shall go up. Well, that suggests that they would need to climb to a higher location after the wall fell, which we've confirmed the topography of the city made necessary. So when you just read that, you say they're going to go up. Well, just coming now. Well, maybe talking about literally, they're going to go up because that's how the city was. It was built as part of this mound, and so the wall collapses. We then can go up. And then we can get into the city because the walls that kept us out have been collapsed and broken down and allowed us to get over the retaining wall. All right, well, that would work, wouldn't it? Now, the mud brick wall that was atop of the retaining wall, it survived only in the northern and the northeastern section of the city. So the wall in that location apparently didn't fall. Okay, so in the northern and in the northeastern section of the city, the mud brick wall that's on the retaining wall is there. I mean, obviously not all the way, but something different about that. So apparently the wall didn't fall there. And here is a diagram and Wood's comment about that. He says at the north end, so here's the tell. At the north end, he says numbers one to five, one, two, three, four, five, north and northeast up here, a portion of the mud brick wall red atop the stone retaining wall survived, demonstrating that the city wall did not fall in this area. I can't get this thing to turn off. Didn't fall in this area. Nothing remains of the mud brick city wall at other points investigated, showing that it had collapsed everywhere else. So numbers 6 through 13, 6 through all the way else, that, that it had collapsed there. Remnants of the collapsed city wall were actually found still in place in three places in Jericho. He says number 11, the German excavation here. This is Kenyans where the, he means in place where you saw the collapsed wall. Well, you, you, you have it already, you know, so you can get over the retaining wall. And the 1997 Italian-Palestinian excavation extending Kenyan South Trench at number 8. So here, here. So all of this section up here in the north, it looks like it didn't collapse. And you say, well, so what? Well, let me show you this photograph. 
This is a photograph taken by the, the German excavators in the early part of the 20th century that shows the northern retaining wall, and you see the thick mud brick wall that's built on top of the retaining wall, and you see homes and things connected to this thick brick wall that's up here. And why is that significant? Well, maybe that section was spared whatever force God used to bring down the walls. Whether you want to call it an earthquake, or I don't care, because it's God acting to bring the walls down, right? So he, whatever force he used, perhaps the northern section was spared so as to protect Rahab and her family who were awaiting rescue from the Israelites. So maybe God says, okay, you got your whole family into this house that we're told is built into the wall. Don't worry about it. I'll spare that section and I'll take the rest of it down. Well, maybe that was what happened there. After all, as I say, her house was built into the city wall. Moreover, it's, it's interesting that she urged the Israelite spies to flee to the hills in order to hide there. And the hills, by the way, are just north of Jericho. This is from the south, looking north. If her place is on the northern part of the tail and that was spared, the hills are right there. See, I see her saying, just go straight there. Go straight to those hills and you wait there. So that's Jericho. Now we're told in Joshua chapter, in Joshua 8, that Israel, after conquering Jericho, conquered and burned Ai to the west. Now this was after an unsuccessful report or a, a, an unsuccessful attack that's reported in Joshua chapter 7, which as you know, that resulted from, the, from Achan taking some of the devoted things at Jericho for himself. Joshua chapter 7 verse 2 says, I was near Beth-Avon and east of Bethel. Now since the 19th century, I was identified with Et-Tel. But excavations at that site, they reveal that, that and the excavations most recently by a man named Joseph Calloway in the 1960s. The excavations at that site, thought to be I, et tel, those excavations revealed that it wasn't occupied at the time of Joshua. Okay, well, for, because of that, that's led a number of scholars to conclude that the biblical account is not historically credible. Now, see, you would think that somebody would say, maybe I've made a mistake. But that's never going to happen, see, because if I've got something here, I say, you see, that's I, they went there, Bible's junk. Okay, well, that's, that's where we are with many people. In fact, Callaway, the excavator at, 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 at Tell in the 60s, Callaway says, I is simply an embarrassment to every view of the conquest that takes the biblical and archaeological evidence seriously. So it's a joke, the Bible's not true, blah, blah, blah. All right, well, uh, Bryant Wood, again, has made a strong and detailed case that at tell has been misidentified as I, showing that it doesn't match what is said about I in Joshua chapter 7 and 8. A much better candidate for I is Kerbet el Maketir, which is here. You see, it's about, it's just over a half mile west of at tell. It not only fits the geographical requirements, but as Wood has shown through some 13 years of excavation at the site, where he began, he excavated there from 95 to 2000, and then for political reasons, he had to stop from 2000 ongoing, and Scott Stripling since January of 2014 has now been heading the excavation there. But you've had 13 years of excavation going on, so it not only fits the geographical requirements, but it also fits other aspects of Joshua's eye. For example, it was fortified at the time of the conquest. That's implied from the statement that, that it was gated, that you see in Joshua chapter 7, verse 5 and 829. It had a gate on the north side. And what's interesting in Joshua 811 says we put, took the Israel in front of the city to, on the north. And as Wood says, well, what would be the front of the city except where the entrance is? And this place has a gate on the north. So you, you have that going for it. It was smaller than Gibeon, which is a requirement set forth in Joshua 7, 3 and 10, 2. And it was destroyed by fire around 1400 B.C. Here is the location on a map. And you can see here, here's Jericho. Here's Kerbet el Maketir, 
right here, near Beth Avon, east of Bethel. There it sits. So this is something I think is uh, much better. Now, I should give you a footnote, too, that Joshua's eye probably is not the eye that's referred to in connection with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 8, and in Genesis 13, verse 3. Eye in Hebrew simply means ruin. Okay, it simply means ruin. And the site of Etel had long been a ruin by the time Abraham enters into Canaan. So you can see this place being called a ruin, and it was a landmark probably for him, a well-known ruin, and he speaks of it that way. Whereas Kerbet el Maketir is almost certainly Joshua's eye, and it wouldn't be unheard of, see, for a new settlement to adopt or be given the name of its defunct neighbor, especially since it's just over half a mile to the west. Now, that may strike you as odd, but cities have names like that all the time. They adopt names and this kind of thing. So I just wanted you to, to be tuned in. In fact, Bryant Wood equips there's a left eye and a right eye. So I thought that's pretty good. Now, with, with Israel, so we have, we have Jericho, we have I, and then with Israel in control of the central and southern Canaan. You know, they start out the central uh, campaign where they have Jericho and I, and then they turn south and they secure that part of Canaan. Well, with that, we're told in Joshua chapter 11, 1 to 15, that Jabin, the king of Hatzor, which is the largest city in the northern region, he brought together a number of kings in a military alliance. And this huge army, they got many horses and chariots. They were assembled at the waters of Merom. They're there to await Israel's anticipated advance. But Joshua attacks them suddenly, and God gives them the victory, and then the Israelites pursued them as far as, as far as Sidon, and then over here to, in the east to the valley of Mizpah, they chased them to the northeast. Now, they then turned back. I hope you know the story. They then turned back, and they captured Hatzor, which is described in Joshua chapter 11, verse 10, as the head of all the kingdoms of northern Canaan. They killed the king, all who were in the city, and they burned the city. That's in Joshua 11, verses 10 to 13. Now, the average city in Palestine at this time is about 15 to 20 acres. That's, a, that's typical, okay? That's an average city then. Whereas Hatzor, which is Tel El Qaeda, Hatzor is 200 acres. Now, it's an upper and lower city, but it's 200 acres, and that confirms its description as the head of the cities of, the nor of northern Canaan. You see, it was the largest city in the area. It was excavated from 1955 to 1958 by Yigael Yadin, again in 1968 by Yadin, and that work was resumed in 1990 under an archaeologist named Amnon Bentor. So he's still excavating at Hatzor. Now, the site shows that the city was destroyed by fire on a number of occasions. So throughout its lengthy history, you see Hotzer has been destroyed by fire a number of times. Now, Douglas Petrovich, you should be familiar with his name. He's an archaeologist. Petrovich worked with Ben Tor at Hotzer for one season. And he published an article, uh, Douglas Petrovich, in the Journal of the Evangelical uh, Theological Society in 2008, titled The Dating of Hotzer's Destruction in Joshua 11 via Biblical Archaeological and Epigraphical Evidence. And here's what he says. I've got four slides. Try to stick with me on this. This is talking about Hotzer and the various destruction levels. And can we tie any of these levels to around 1400 and the time of Joshua? Petrovich says, but what is known about the Hotzer of Joshua's day and its end? Because Hotzer's been around a long time. Okay, what's known about the Hotzer of Joshua's day and its end? Yadin described late bronze one hotzer of the lower city, straight him to. Is that the second bell? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Uh, thanks for coming.